345, you want to want to get started with your panel? Sure. Thanks, Rick. Uh, so I guess everybody, welcome back from the break. Uh, so we are back now to talk about healthcare restructuring. So thanks to uh, those of you who stuck with us for this. Uh, so we are lucky to have with us today three experts in the healthcare restructuring space. So we have Andrew Turnbull, who is a managing director at Houlihan Loki and their financial restructuring group. Uh, Felicia Gerber Perlman, who is global co-head of McDermott Will and Emery's restructuring and insolvency group, and Paul Rundell, managing director with Alvarez and Marcel and in their restructuring and turnaround group. Uh, I'm Nancy Peterman. I am a shareholder at Greenberg Trorig and their uh, bankruptcy and restructuring group as well, since that's what we all do. Um, so we're going to spend about um, an hour talking about healthcare restructuring. And so in the materials that you have, there are a lot of legal issues covered. We will cover a few of those, but the bulk of what we're going to cover um, will really be giving you an overview of what's going on in the industry itself. So um, we're going to first set the stage for you in terms of what's going on in the healthcare industry, in particular talking about some of the stimulus funding, which through a wrench, at least in uh, uh, both in a good way and a bad way, which we'll talk about for uh, sectors in the healthcare space. And then as we continue on in the presentation, we'll talk about some unique legal and operational issues that uh, healthcare businesses are faced with as they go through a restructuring. Um, and just as with the other panels, watch the um, Q&A for two codes that you will need to get your CLE credit. So those will pop up at some point during the um, our presentation. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew, who's going to at least start walking us through the stimulus funding that uh, many healthcare businesses benefited from and, and continue to benefit from. First error, you got to turn the mute button off. Thanks, Nancy, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, have a chance to chat with you all this afternoon about uh, healthcare restructurings. Uh, we thought it was fitting um, in today's environment. You can't really talk about healthcare restructurings without at least covering these two basics. And uh, there has um, there have been the variety of programs coming from the stimulus to deal with COVID-19, and two that are unique to the healthcare space. You see, sort of summarized here for you on this slide. Uh, what we refer to as the Medicare Advanced and Accelerated Payments. Uh, these are uh, about a about hundred billion dollars of this capital has been deployed and basically what was happening is uh, advanced payments were made which are a la alone um, on fee-for-service Medicare payments. This benefited a lot of hospitals. Uh, the expectation was that these funds would be repaid uh, by the various providers who were the beneficiaries of this $100 billion, uh, starting at about 120 days after the initial um, uh, loans were made. That would have put the repayments starting in August of this year. That did not happen. There's a lot of political pressure than some even suggesting that maybe these loans should be forgiven, or for at least for some people, they should be forgiven. Uh, and so the repayments of these loans has not yet started. Uh, pushed out into next year. Second big program, probably the one that actually gets a little bit more attention, uh, the provider relief funds. This is a $175 billion program. It's actually $100 billion initially, and then it was upsized to $175. Uh, and as you'll see on a subsequent slide, about $120 billion of this amount has been pushed out. These are grant funds. No expectation of refund, uh, so long as the certifications that the providers can make uh, associated with the receipt of these funds uh, are, are satisfactory, and we'll sort of touch upon that at the end. If I could, uh, whoever's controlling, if they could flip to the next slide, just quickly through on the accelerated and advanced payments, you can uh, see from this slide, as I mentioned, a little over three quarters of this money went to short stay hospitals. A variety of other providers uh, picking up the remaining, let's call it $22 billion or so of this capital. Of course, this has created a lot of flood. So as we think about healthcare restructuring, there's been a flood of capital into the marketplace for a lot of these operators and those who perhaps were in trouble and facing uh, financial restructuring or sales or both, or even perhaps uh, liquidations. Uh, a lot of these were stayed because of the amount of capital that was pushed into the system. So this is on the loan side. These monies should in theory be coming back or have to be repaid. So that will create its own working capital dynamics if that in fact is the case. People might've spent the money may not have the ability to get Medicare fee-for-service receipts for an extended period of time. That will stress them financially and as a 
good restructuring optimist, we look at that as a possibility for new uh, work for all of us. On the next slide is a summary of where the provider relief funds of the 175 billion uh, attributable to this category, a little over 120 billion has been distributed. You can see right out of the gate, 50 billion was pushed out. It was pushed out in a pretty general distribution based on anyone who was doing fee-for-service work on the Medicare side. Uh, some of the clients I was working with at the time would sort of call and say, hey, guess what? $15 million just showed up in our bank account. We didn't even know it was coming. Uh, so it was a fairly um, a buckshot, sort of shotgun type approach. Uh, they got a little bit more sophisticated with the targeted distributions, trying to hone in more on those who were dealing with COVID issues, rural health care, skilled nursing facilities, safety net hospitals. You can see it's sort of smaller distributions over a variety of um, amounts. What happens to the remaining um, $55 billion? Not clear. Um, from a restructuring perspective, there are definitely places in the marketplace where we imagine this money when capital will be needed or is already needed. Um, but there are lots of people who have been receivers of these funds and have not ha had sort of the level of financial distress that one might imagine. So last and not least, on the next slide, I'll just sort of talk a little bit about um, some of the um, certification process. And this is, uh, this is a moving target, uh, as you can imagine, um, with the government. So the question, the theory was all along that these funds on the provider relief, this is the $175 billion program, uh, must be attributable to either costs or revenues lost attributable to COVID-19. And so some of the details, there's a lot more details that you see on this slide. So for example, if you incur costs for supplies and equipment or physical structures, the, you know, lots of, lots of organizations were putting up tents either to treat COVID patients or non-COVID patients, um, you know, staffing, all sorts of different costs, which are attributable to dealing with uh, the coronavirus. The other side is a little bit more ambiguous, and I think Felicia is going to talk a little bit about this and this question of lost revenues. So as I think many people know, hospitals all across the country were shut down on operating you know, non-essential services. So traditional types of uh, care that they were providing were shut down while they uh, basically freed up capacity, in many cases for patients that never showed up, uh, and as a result, a tremendous amount of revenue was lost. And so people, I think, initially interpreted that as, well, it's lost revenue. Somebody didn't show up. They would normally, ordinarily have paid a $5,000. I lost $5,000 of revenue. Uh, there's some recent guidance that's come out, and I actually would tell you that what was posted on the HHS website, while I'm you know, vague, suggested that it's not necessarily the dollars lost, but the costs incurred that otherwise would have been covered by the dollars lost um, that are reimbursable. So there's a lot of debate going on. It's just recently started in the last week, week and a half or so about what this entails. There are, uh, there's a cottage industry, industry that's grown up of plenty of people who are now helping providers in the system try and work through what the rules and regulations are, what they can and cannot keep. There was a lot of money pushed out in this program to hospital organizations, for example, that had sold hospitals six, 12, 18 months ago. They were receiving other people's money. So it was, as you can appreciate, when you try and push this much money out as fast as they did, uh, there were a lot of mistakes made and hopefully um, people will do the right thing and have returned the monies that they weren't entitled to and will be able to certify to keep what they're supposed to keep. And of course, what's, what's left will be returned. Theoretically, it'll be recycled. Uh, my gut is that's not likely to happen. So quick overview for you on those provider programs. Uh, that have been put in place and all said $220 billion pushed into the marketplace. Nevertheless, there will be healthcare restructurings coming, but we haven't seen a lot of them of late, partly because of this. And I'll just say a couple examples of, you know, the money going out very, very quickly and the general funds that went out. We had one matter we were involved in. It was a skilled, a group of skilled nursing facilities that had actually downsized from 100 locations to 22 locations they received in this initial kind of push out of funds, funds equal to uh, a business that still operated 100 facilities. So as you can imagine, all of a sudden they had this massive multiple millions of dollars of influx of cash in their bank account. Uh, so good for them, but ultimately that's going to have to be addressed down the road in terms of most likely some returned payments uh, you know, to the government. And so Paul, 
uh, or Felicia, maybe one of you can comment a little bit about that. That's a lot of money that went into the healthcare industry in terms of these different stimulus funds. Um, so how, how has that impacted the industry? Because there's certainly a lot of cash now sitting, sitting with different providers. Oh, I'll start and then Felicia, I'll turn it over to you. Um, what, we, what we've seen is uh, the clients that we had in healthcare restructuring in the fourth quarter, the first quarter of, fourth quarter of last year, first quarter of this year, they were pre-COVID. They, they went right through the cycle, even though we went virtual in court hearings. Um, the restructurings continued at about the same pace you would expect. But what happened is March, April, we saw some spike in um, restructurings across all industries, but also in healthcare. Uh, people panicked because revenue stopped. What ended up happening was as the funds started rolling out in May and June, that's really pushed off a lot of restructurings uh, in all industries, including healthcare. There's a lot of providers that did not have money all of a sudden had the money to get through uh, for a period of time. Um, how long that will last, we're, we're starting to see some strains. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later and what sub-industries. But uh, certainly the healthcare industry was starting to get on in, in uh, have some challenges that got delayed uh, probably by about six, maybe eight months tops from March of last year. Uh, but we do see- uh, you have them see. by now. You shouldn't get them. Oh, sorry. Uh, we will see a spike up. Sorry, I heard some feedback. Uh, we will see a spike up, we believe, coming soon. But with that, Felicia, why don't you talk about some of the the, uh, the legal things going on with the recouping, the testing, and some other things that you're saying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll, I'll start with just one issue with the Medicare advance payments that Andrew was, uh, was talking about, and, and that is that, like some of the other payments, um, they were not available for debtors. So as an initial matter, when you had distressed hospitals, um, they could not look to that. Um, in addition, the application you had to fill out to request the Medicare advance payments, um, when it was initially released, was different by kind of region that they reported to. And in, in some areas, the application actually said that you had to say not only whether you had filed for bankruptcy, which you know, is pretty obvious, it's a public filing, um, but whether you had hired restructuring counsel or had considered filing for bankruptcy. So in order to file, to request the Medicare advance payments, which could have been the solution for some providers to their uh, distress, you had to have somebody willing to certify that you had not considered filing for bankruptcy or hired restructuring counsel, which obviously would eliminate a large number of providers um, who could have benefited from these funds and it possibly could have at least for some time period solved the problem. Um, to move on to the grants, you know, while the grants did provide and continue to provide a lot of economic relief, um, it, it's really challenging to figure out how much relief they provide. As an initial matter, Andrew commented on how you don't know when they're coming or how much is coming. So as all of us know, when you're in with a client and you're trying to plan and figure out when your liquidity runs out, and be prepared to file or figure out a transaction deadline, you need to know how much money you have. Um, so it's great if $15 million shows up, um, but not as great if it shows up the day after you made a decision that you might not have made had you known that, or if you anticipated $15 million showing up and then it doesn't. So it really, from the world of restructuring, had less impact and less help in terms of strategy than it might have had otherwise, you know, understanding that it was being rolled out very quickly. Um, once you receive the funds, though, the reporting requirements and the requirements for keeping the funds have been very challenging. Um, all you knew up front was that you were able to keep funds to reimburse you for increased expenses or lost revenue. It was not defined what that was or what the time period was. 
Um, in addition, for hospital systems, it was supposed to be done on a hospital by hospital basis. Um, so if you received a lot of funds at one hospital, but it was a different hospital in the system that had suffered the losses, there was significant question as to whether you can retain the funds. Um, as Andrew indicated, in the past week, there has been more guidance that has come out. With that guidance, they have pushed out the reporting period, which was supposed to start in October. It was initially supposed to start over the summer. Because of the uncertainty, that time was pushed to October, and now it's been pushed into 2021. Um, but they did start to provide some clarity, but that clarity shows some of the difficulties that hospitals will have. Two key things are when looking at lost revenue, what are you comparing it to? There was a question, were you comparing that to your budget for 2020, that you had budgeted a you million know, dollars in revenue, you now were trending to 500,000, so that's lost revenue. Or do you budget, to, or do you compare it to 2019? Um, the recent guidance seems to indicate that it's to 2019. Um, from a restructuring point of view, if you think about that, if you were working with a distressed uh, hospital, hospital system, healthcare provider, and had made changes to their to expenses, to their uh, the services provided from 2019, because 2019 was a very poor year, with anticipation that 2020 would be better, you are now comparing your poor 2019 to your current in order to determine what your lost revenue is, which will substantially reduce the amount of the CARES Act funds that can be retained. Um, in addition, they've come out saying that it is a um, lost income calculation, which will be required to take into account expenses which will take longer for providers to calculate and there's more uncertainty in terms of how those expenses will be calculated. So you now have a lot of providers that have received funds. They are uncertain whether they can keep the funds. Um, and we see two different problems coming from that. One is that it's masking what the real liquidity is. You look at the balance sheet, you see cash and you don't know whether that cash is cash that can be maintained or not. So it's hard, hard to determine the financial health. Um, in addition, there is a lot of indication that on the back end of this, not only will the government look to recoup funds in excess of the calculations, but after that, the uh, next round of activity may be um, essentially fraud actions against providers who wrongly calculate how much they could keep, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally given all the ambiguity. Um, so you're gonna have two different rounds where you're gonna have increased level of stress on the finances of these systems that have received money because of the need to return it and the potential litigation uh, risk. So we see a lot of uh, stress and distress in the, in the healthcare industry throughout 2021 or you know, from uh, the crowd that's listening to this, I'd say a lot of opportunity to go in and help them through that to hopefully more true financial health rather than uh, financial health based on funds that it's uncertain whether they can retain. And I think Felicia, you made a couple of really important points for people to focus on. One is that there are a lot of businesses in healthcare sitting on a lot of cash right now, um, but there, that creates tr tremendous uncertainty, at least with the clients that we're working with. I mean, we have clients who have paid off their credit facilities, like they have you know, they look like they're the picture of financial health, but they have no idea how much money they're going to be able to retain at the end of the day. And they have a fear that ultimately they're really out of cash. They just can't quite predict where they will be. Um, and then kind of, oh, give everybody a chance to wrap up on, on you know, CARES and stimulus funding. But um, certainly all of this money was, was helpful because the healthcare industry was certainly significantly impacted by COVID-19, um, but because the funds came out so quickly without a lot of guidance, just like in every other industry where the monies went in, there has been a lot of confusion about how you can use the funds. Um, Andrew mentioned, you know, uh, deals that were going on. We had a deal that kind of closed right about the time of COVID-19. We turned over, our client actually turned over the monies that they received, and now we're going through this 
unbelievably complicated process of getting the monies from the new operator of some nursing homes back to our client and then back out to the government. So, I mean, there's just been a lot of confusion and the guidance is a little bit behind. There's now clear guidance on how you deal with that, but there was not at the time. So um, any final words on, on the CARES funds or, or should we move on to capital markets uh, and what's going on in the capital markets? I'd add one thing, and this is more for the accountants here, so I will not weigh in with any detail or color because that would be poor form for, for a lawyer, but but, but uh, defer to them. There is okay, Felicia, it's not going to stop me from giving you my legal opinion. No, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so I will play, play with the numbers and Andrew can play with the words, switching roles here. Um, <laughs> a significant question that has come up in terms of the, the funds that were received, um, how you deal with them when you're calculating covenant compliance. And, you know, whether they can or cannot be included. Um, you know, they're not income. So when you're looking at covenants that are based on income, how do you take them into account? Um, and uh, whether there will be any clarity or certainty in that. So I think that that's gonna be another avenue for concern and financial distress um, as we move forward for the next uh, few quarters. Yeah, I will just say on that topic, Felicia, I mean, it's been, it's come up and I know that we've done a little bit of canvassing some of the large healthcare lenders about how do they view it. And I think as perhaps I would have expected, no great surprise, their view is it's case by case. They're going to look at each individual case. Uh, they're going to make a determination. I think the key question is going to be, when is it make or break as far as blowing a covenant or not? And I think that'll be an important question. Could also lead to, you know, um, challenges by lenders saying, well, we don't think you calculated correctly. We think you actually have a covenant default. Lenders, presumably companies will take a position, a more aggressive position if it otherwise means they can pass. Um, so I think we're going to see a little bit of uncertainty on that. But um, I will tell you, I'm not sort of writing up a, um, or having great expectations that people are going to say, well, even though it came, even though you booked it as revenue, you can't count it as revenue or income as far as a um, collection. The question is, if you collect it and book it as revenue in Q3 of 2020, and you have to give it back in Q1 of 2021, what does that do? That seems yeah. to be a big challenge right. for people because now you may have a, a loss that you otherwise had booked previously, or you're going to restate earnings from three quarters ago. Well, and to switch back from playing accountant to playing lawyer, um, you know, I love when you say uh, case by case basis because that inherently walks it into the issues. <laughs> Um, that uh, create a lot of, uh, um, how about excitement and opportunity for our area? Because yeah, that's the inherent Paul, problem. Right? Paul is going to be so busy counting these dollars both both ways. It doesn't matter, right, Paul? Yeah, yeah. It, it'll, it'll keep changing. So, I mean, um, you know, I think the guidance, I think I saw this coming from a loss bottom line versus revenue. I think the problem with the revenue is there's too many ways to play games, at least in a case we have here, I testified to this. The problem I have with the revenue loss is you can actually make money and that's not the purpose of the CARES Fund. So I actually do not disagree with where the government's going. I think they have inevitably will get it right. It just takes time because there's so many providers and there's so many ways they're impacting. They're, they're trying to start broad and I think they're gonna get more and more narrow as they see what's going on and how people are using the funds. Paul, do you want to tell us which party you think will get it right first? Wh which, uh, which sector will get it right? Oh, which political party? <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm staying out of that one. Right. <laughs> Suddenly the chat feature of the Q&A feature goes wild. <laughs> yeah, that's yes, right. That's exactly. That's, that's, yeah. All right, so Andrew, why don't you tell, walk us through a little bit what's going on in the capital markets uh, in the industry right now? Well, <laughs> is it really you know, active? Nancy, or, I, yeah. <laughs> in sort of preparing my thoughts on this topic and this question, it was, I mean, I could go on, I could probably take the, the remaining portion of this segment. Um, let me sort of try and distill it down. So um, first of all, I get sort of accused frequently as being a restructuring person, as being a pessimist. I'm always looking for the bad side. I think that people are misunderstanding. I'm an optimistic restructuring person, which just has the perception of being pessimistic to most other people. Um, look, I think it's safe to say it's unbelievable what's happened from a recovery perspective. Back in March and April, we would, none of us, I don't think, would have anticipated the rebound to be as strong as it is. What do I think 
what do I think gives rise to that? Um, look, I think there's a couple things. One, I think generally speaking, our capital markets have a long bias. Um, and so what's happened is, as the markets bounce back, people have a generally a perspective of being long in various investments. If they're not keeping up with the Joneses, then the Joneses move their capital elsewhere and people lose their jobs. It's a pretty sort of cynical view of it, but I think that's got a lot to do with what goes on. The other issue that I put a lot of stock in is it's a relative game. Uh, so you've probably all heard the analogy of you don't have to be able to outrun the bear. You just have to be able to outrun the people that you're running with, and then you don't need to worry. And I think there's a lot of truth to that from a market's perspective, which is, um, look, you look at the U.S. market. There's a lot of relative government, governmental stability. I say that notwithstanding the fact that it's almost October in a presidential election year. Uh, the markets here have lots of liquidity. Um, you're not dealing with the Eurozone where there are sort of weak economies tugging on, on stronger economies. So all of those sort of opportunities mean that there's a lot of people with a lot of capital looking to make an investment and a lot of pressure to keep up with the Joneses. And when you put all of those elements together, debt and equity deals we're seeing get done, dividend recaps, you've got a high yield market averaging, you know, high yield market in the 6% range. I mean, these are sort of uncommon and sort of, at least from a restructuring guy's perspective, I scratch my head and say, how can it be? Put on top of that, all of the stimulus funds, we've talked about $220 billion being pushed into the healthcare market. Deals are getting done because people are searching and scrounging for yield. Uh, I think that's true of all of us. Well, to get too focused on the case law and whether you can or cannot get an order from a bankruptcy judge regarding your Medicare uh, provider agreement, um, in a manner that you think benefits you. Because you know, we often say that this is an area where you can clearly win the battle and lose the war. Um, you might think that you won, that you got an order that prevented recoupment or that provided that the provider agreement was a statutory entitlement and therefore you can you know, save the money on the cure. Um, but remember, as we said at the beginning, that. They're the party that provides you your primary uh, uh, cash flow on a regular basis. And they're the federal government. And uh, they're going to find a way to come back and uh, get it from you one way or another. And you know we've seen that in a number of cases where there's been a positive ruling in a bankruptcy court. And then the government starts withholding payments based on some other um, error, mistake, something immediately thereafter so um, and I think I think it's just important as you said just to remember the government is for certain businesses in the healthcare space who rely on Medicare and Medicaid or both um, they're almost your business partner I mean there's yeah. some some of these businesses that the they get you know I don't know 70 80 plus percent of their revenue and Medicare and Medicaid fundings and you have to as you said, kind of think about, you, you're going to go to battle with them. I mean, the government generally takes the position outside of bankruptcy that a provider agreement and number is an entitlement, a statutory entitlement. In bankruptcy, they take the position of an executory contract because of the cure, cure rights. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, as you said, you're, you're going to have to continue doing business with them, whether it's the reorganized business or it's a new um, owner of that business, they're going to have to make peace with the government. So I think you do have to think strategically and, and practically how you're gonna work through those issues. Absolutely. I'll just say this, I, they, run, they run the government like I like to run a 363 auction. Uh, the rules <laughs> change when it suits my purpose. And I think I can get more money out of somebody by changing those rules. Is, um, you're right back to that case by case talking. basis. <laughs> only one rule yeah. in the bankruptcy auction, there are no rules. That is true. Uh, uh, and then what, what about nonprofits? I mean, there's quite a bit of, uh, in healthcare, I think probably all of us have dealt with a lot of uh, nonprofits in, in the uh, restructuring space. So Felicia, maybe touch on, or, or Paul, you can as well. I know you do in a lot, a lot in the tax exempt space, some of the issues that come up dealing with nonprofits. Paul, do you want to go ahead or do you want me to start? Sure, um, I'm happy to. I mean, not for profit. I mean, there's a lot of healthcare, specifically in healthcare that are not for profits. 
healthcare tends to be a local game and there's a lot of faith-based as well as not faith-based not-for-profits that are in healthcare providing care to the, the people. Um, <clears throat> I like to say that it's very similar to, you know, uh, um, a for-profit. In some ways it can be. I always tell clients just because you're a not-for-profit doesn't mean you can't make money. Just because you're a for-profit doesn't mean you do make money. So in a lot of ways it's, it's similar. I think the real the difference is is kind you of tell them that in the bitch, Paul. I'm sorry. No, once he gets the retainer. The <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. It's um, you know, the real question is um, who's kind of the shareholder, or, or and, and there's other considerations. So it's not uncommon, for instance, skill nursing. It could be Catholic based or Jewish based, and so faith based organizations adds a whole different complexity element. Um, to to the not for profits that that you have to consider, and I don't know, Felicia, I don't know what your thoughts are, but it, it's a whole different animal, uh, especially faith based not for profits. I would agree. I think you have you know dealing with a board of a not for profit is is very different than dealing with a board of a for profit. Um, you're starting to see some change now with the growth of for profits, where some not for profits have started to. Uh, um, understand that the, the skills needed for a board are different than perhaps how they used to look at them. But you really do have the whole mission-based issue that um, fundamentally can be challenging as a restructuring lawyer or advisor coming in to advise a board. Um, the board is made up of healthcare providers and people who are focused on the mission, um, not a lot of focus on the economics. Um, you know, I, I think there's a, a kind of a saying that you hear often when you're dealing with not-for-profit restructurings that's, you know, no money, no mission, because you often get this view from your client that just don't worry about it. We're doing the good work. It's all going to work out. Like, not really when you don't pay your rent, your employees and other things doesn't work out quite so well. Um, so you really need to have a, a different approach to walk them through the financial issues to get them to perhaps make decisions that are in their mind contrary to their mission. Um, and the faith base certainly adds an additional challenge to that. Um, you also, you know, Nancy, you mentioned debt for equity swaps. Um, fundamentally not an option in a not-for-profit. Um, so you have less that you can give your, your debt holders. You have to negotiate with them differently um, because you don't have that option and that really changes the dynamics. And obviously the tax exempt bonds um, had, have a lot of unique provisions relative to corporate bonds and are governed differently, um, which really impact the negotiations. Um, and you know, to that, I would say there is so much difference that it's really important that those that you are working with have experience with tax exempt bonds. Um, because otherwise the solution they craft is likely not to work. <laughs> that is uh, very good advice. And I will also <laughs> say on uh, having been through that, trying to figure out what structure you can uh, make work for a restructuring. But the other thing with tax exempt bonds, at least that I've found is that a lot of these businesses are so over levered with different tranches of bonds, there's no ability to bring in additional financing. And so, um, and the bondholders, depending on what your bondholder group looks like, sometimes that you're not able to get you know, a couple bondholders or a handful of bondholders to step up with some additional funding. So you get restricted to some of the, you know, the different funds that are sitting, debt service reserve fund, other funds. Um, so sometimes your financing is very limited in those cases, making them even more challenging. Um, the other thing I'll throw out, which I find is a very basic concept, but strangely enough run across, uh, even in the tax exempt bond space, people who are just not aware is that a business that is uh, not for profit uh, involuntary petitions cannot be filed against it. Um, so I have sat through negotiations where, you know, the bondholders are threatening an involuntary and I'm like, well, good luck with that. Um, you know, we're a nonprofit, so that's not going to succeed. I actually had to provide case law and statutory authority last time on that and finally convinced really? them of, of that point. So just, again, there's little nuances, um, you know, in the nonprofit space, there's, you know, some code provisions dealing with uh, sales in the nonprofit space in terms of attorney general approvals and things like that. So again, work, work with those in your firm who know, know that area. Um, just on the last thing on legal, and then we'll talk a little bit about what, 
what we're seeing generally sector by sector in the industry. Um, I'm, I'm legal also, you know, all, all of us do a lot of healthcare work and have a lot of exposure to different regulations and other things, but healthcare, as you can tell, is an extremely regulated industry. So you wanna work with your healthcare professionals at your firm to help you through those issues. And just as an example, um, it was just recently in a case that we're working on, American Addiction Centers, where we were putting, the company wanted to put together a keep. So we're trying to figure out, you know, what are the typical targets as you're putting together a keep? It's usually like, you know, hitting EBITDA targets or whatever you wanna come up with can't do that in that space. So there's an actual statutory prohibition from a regulatory perspective that would make it arguably criminal to have statutes with those types of parameters. And so we had to come up with a whole different structure and convince the U.S. trustee that it was still acceptable, you know, as, as a keep and still, you know, not, not just, a, you know, trying to convince people to stay through a, through a restructuring process. So again, you know, make sure you talk to your, your healthcare and healthcare regulatory um, colleagues to make sure you're complying with all of the different healthcare regulations out there that touch different parts of the business. So um, let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing sector by sector. So I know I've heard people talking about hospitals, um, skilled nursing, I just mentioned addiction treatment centers. Um, kind of what, what's, what are each of you seeing, what's coming across your desk in terms of where the rest of the participants should be looking for opportunities? I'm happy to start. I mean, look, I think uh, one of the sectors that obviously was challenged before even COVID was, you know, the 5,000 or so hospitals in America. There are, as I mentioned in the capital markets comments, the haves and the have-nots, and that's so much the case in the hospital industry. Um, Rural healthcare is a very difficult place to operate. Lots of them are challenged. Um, great people on the board who have great intentions and have no idea what they're doing as far as helping turn around a distressed hospital. Um, and they often find themselves in trouble. Now that said, the stimulus funds that have come in have sort of solved some of those issues. Uh, when I say solved, maybe the better word is delayed. Um, those aren't problems that are necessarily gonna get solved with a little bit of capital. They'll just sort of postpone the problem and quite frankly, a lot of those uh, boards will not sort of force, feel the need to address the issue earlier. And sometimes that leads to facilities closing because they just wait too long. Uh, I'd also add in that sector, the, the number of buyers interested in rural uh, operations, I believe has diminished. We don't see it as much. It's usually those who are uh, locally, sort of the urban and suburban locations that are the source of the migration from rural parts they're probably your most likely buyers. And if they're not interested, you can find yourself in real trouble. Uh, the other sector that, and so I think that will be delayed. Other sector that I see trouble sort of on the horizon is senior living generally. Um, I put a special caveat on those continuing uh, CCRCs, continuing care retirement communities, uh, especially if they were selling an insurance product. Those, um, those communities were pretty tightly wired from a, what I call a feasibility study perspective anyway. Put off three, six months of occupancy uh, in, inflows. Outflows have been relatively consistent. Um, inflows have been diminished. If they had shovels in the ground associated with new facilities that they're building, all of a sudden you're gonna have a problem filling those facilities. You might all remember back in Chicago, the Claire Water Tower is a good example. I think it opened its doors the day Lehman filed. Um, it was a long burn until the cash flows caught up with them, but ultimately went into bankruptcy and, and needed to be sold. And so those types of issues will come, I believe. It'll take some time. Whereas on the other side, there will be the, those who have really benefited. I mean, who, who would have thought telehealth would move as quickly as it has from sort of an adoption perspective in the marketplace? So what does that do for perspective of, um, medical office buildings and REITs that fund medical office buildings and other facilities, there seem to be that those, you know, there'll be some benefits for telehealth to the detriment of some others. And so as the world accelerates its advancement in various different regards, I think we're gonna see the haves and the have nots. Telehealth will be a good one. REITs probably sort of struggle, uh, both on the senior living side and from their MOB side hospitals, inevitably, I think there's just a transition as payers and patients move to not be institutionalized and try to deal with more stuff at home or in an outpatient setting. 
Paul, I think I think I threw enough meat out there for you to attack. Yeah, no, and I can add to it. it it's it, I did a call yesterday, interesting enough, Andrew, where a whole business set up. They want to acquire the rural health, and they're going to convert them to tele, telehealth constructs where they're going to provide the care through telemedicine, they believe, and try to roll up some rural providers where it makes sense. So uh, combining the telehealth and the rural, I, I agree. I mean, it's typically either a large system by the rural that acquires it as kind of an AM surge, or in this case, telemedicine could provide a solution for um, the rural market, um, skilled nursing, in my opinion, I think the answer is up there too, is on fire and not in a great way. Anything that's really highly levered is not doing great. Uh, the difference is skilled nursing tends to be highly levered or high rents, and there's no census coming in. People are scared because it's been a hotbed for COVID. Um, in actuality, they do a better job than most other employees. They test all the patients every, almost every day. And um, because of that, they have a lot more hits. But it, it's actually calmed down a lot. But the beginning of COVID has really scared a lot of people. So the census coming in is very slow. I, almost all, most of my clients right now are in skill nursing, either national players or local players. Uh, and then the question is, how do the REITs respond? A lot of them are publicly traded REITs. They can't do cash flow loans or rent. So how do they restructure the rents so to give the operators time to get through the COVID environment? It's a real challenge. They're very much, it's a necessary industry. There's no tell anything with that industry. How do we fix it? It's gonna be a real challenge. And then the and then I think it's the overall consolidation of the small hospitals. It could be rural critical access or just inner city. That consolidation needs to happen, and um, people have been talking about that for years. I'm actually hopeful that this COVID helps facilitate that in an expedited fashion, because I do believe we have too many providers across the country. And with Felicia and, and Nancy, I don't know if you guys want to chime in as well. Yeah. I'll, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, as they, you know, I'm going to jump on the senior living bandwagon. Mm -hmm. I know Nancy will all foreshadow it as well. So <laughs> clearly everybody out there should know that, um, you know, look, costs are up. The cost to, to run their facility in what the, you know, different state and local governments are deeming a safe manner between um, PPE, additional testing, plexiglass in different places, all sorts of things that they need to do um, is huge and census is down and not coming back up anytime soon. Um, I talked to one REIT who said that even if census came back up to where they were pre-COVID, which he didn't expect, um, they would be losing money because it still would not put them in a position that with all the new costs, they would be cash flow positive. Um, so when you're looking at that and you know the census isn't coming back, um, you know, there's nothing to do but restructure. Um, the CCRCs uh, are also being hit because, you know, their business model is based on people moving in at a time when they don't need the care um, so that they're less expensive and staying, you know, longer and the cost of those residents increases over time. Um, people aren't moving in early. People, people read all the articles and saw everything that's happening in the different forms of senior living and, and they're staying in their homes longer. So even when people do start to move in, they're moving in at a time when they already need more services, the cost is already higher. So the, the business model um, will, will, will need to change. It just won't function anymore. Um, I did not obviously know about Paul's call, but I wrote down when, when Andrew mentioned rural health, that the only solutions that I could see to rural health were either policy-based government intervention or partnership with telehealth. It, 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 that I don't see other solutions. So that was interesting to hear about that. Um, and the last one I'd throw in that wasn't mentioned is the PPMs, the physician practice management groups, um, I think have been hit particularly dental, derm, other more, um, less necessary services and more um, 
close in your face type services where people are less comfortable. They rebounded more quickly initially as uh, things started to get arguably more in control from COVID, but they've started to fall back off and people don't expect that rebound necessarily to, uh, to last. And uh, the less necessary services are going to be hit harder anyways, because with the job loss leads to a loss of insurance and the loss of insurance will lead to individuals not seeking health care that they don't absolutely need. Yeah, and just to follow on on the PPM, so physician practice management groups, if, uh, for those of you who don't run across that term, um, at the beginning of the shutdown, that was largely what I was seeing. And so I will say that with the shutdown, some lenders were taking opportunities just kind of squeeze the private equity owners to get those private equity owners to invest additional funds to prop up for the future, the PPM. So we did a lot of really out of court restructurings and some preferred equity instruments, things like that to get some additional liquidity in the business to prop it up on a go forward basis. Um, and it is, you know, I think the one example someone gave me as a, like for a dental PPM, if you go to the dentist twice a year and you happen to miss one of your appointments because it was during the shutdown, you're not gonna make it up by doing two more visits at the end of the year. Maybe you'll just do one visit. So it's gonna have a, you know, kind of a, a hit to the cash flow that's not gonna be replaced. And then now I will say now I am almost exclusively seeing across my desk, senior living. So I think that's our consistent uh, <laughs> discussion here. For me, it's skilled nursing. Um, so I have, um, if you think about that, that makes a lot of sense. So for some skilled nursing facilities, not all, but for some of them or some that are a little bit more like a rehab facility, they rely on you know, elective surgeries and things like that where people have that elective surgery then go in you know, for a few months at a skilled nursing facility, a rehab facility to recover. That didn't exist a few months ago. It's starting up again. So census is improving a little bit, but not where it needs to be. Um, the other uh, issue I'll just throw out, which is kind of the reverse of that, where I'm dealing with some, uh, uh, I have landlords in, in another matter, and the skilled nursing facility is so flush with cash that they're litigating with us in a bankruptcy case, every single legal issue that are in our materials from is this a residential to non-residential real property lease, um, which the judge ruled it was non-residential. Our leases were all non, are apparently all non-residential real property leases. They have now filed about an 80 page complaint challenging the leases as financing arrangements and raising all, of, all sorts of other challenges. Um, and, and I view that as a function of the fact that they can survive on cash flow because they're so flush with cash. And so now they're fighting with us and uh, you know that'll be a multi, multi, I was going to say multi-month, but more like multi-year litigation, uh, unless we can uh, get to some sort of resolution on that. So I continue to see a lot of uh, skilled nursing, which I was seeing pre-COVID, um, but uh, there's been an uptick in that, especially over the past few months for me. And so we've got about three minutes left, I can see. So um, why don't I throw out just generally to the three of you, um, kind of what have you learned over the past few months, like dealing with COVID, dealing with the issues in the healthcare industry, kind of what, what words of wisdom can you leave the audience with in our last uh, three minutes? How about you, Paul? Looks like you have something to say. <laughs> you, you know, um, what I would say is I actually think um, the last six months has been much less healthcare than I would have thought, even though I've stayed busy. It was mostly pre-COVID cases. I believe the next three to six months is going to get it busier. I think there's a lot of healthcare providers out there that have waited and pushed and used the CARES funds to get through the period which they should have done. And I think it's over the next three to six months, I believe there's going to be a lot of restructurings in and out of courts that are going to be necessary to deal with the issues that everyone has put off because the care funds have patched the issue. That's what I would say. Andrew? Uh, you know, what have I learned? I mean, I've learned that I don't like commuting and I'll enjoy not having to do it. Travel, <laughs> traveling is fantastic. Court hearings via Zoom works great for me. It's not so good for testimony, but no, look, all kidding aside, um, it's... Um, it's been a surprising three or three to six months, particularly in healthcare restructuring. Paul's exactly right, which is um, the problems that were there before have effectively been postponed for some definite period of time. 
um, but they'll be back. And I think it's a question of perseverance, keeping an eye out, looking for opportunities, helping companies where you can. And, you know, as, uh, as we like to say, sometimes it's nuts and berries in a market like this. And that's what we all have to go sort of work with. But there will be problems coming. And I think, unfortunately, um, for a lot of people, those problems will be pretty dramatic because the, the issues that they had before have just been sort of prolonged and now they're into a new marketplace. So we'll take Paul's example that we talked about on rural hospitals. They were challenged before. Now there's going to be a lot less interest for people to come in and actually scoop them up and save those communities. And as I think we all know, if you're in a town with 50,000 people, you've got one hospital and the hospital closed down, it changes the entire economic profile of that town. Uh, you lose a lot of employment and disappears. Uh, the likelihood of attracting new employers drops dramatically. Uh, and that's just part of what's going to happen to rural America. So to Felicia's point, unless um, regulatory or legislative changes happen, there's going to be a shift in the healthcare marketplace and we're going to have to find solutions for it. And look, as a Canadian coming from a, a system of governmental healthcare, it's a totally different animal. But here, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be have-nots that are going to be found, you know, having a real tough time in healthcare. And then we're at time, but I'll give Felicia you the last word for 30 seconds. <laughs> I just had to say, think outside the box. The business models have to change. You've got to look to partner with other providers, like Paul's example of rural health with, with, with telehealth. Um, you don't need to provide every service in the community. You should specialize. And, and um, I think that all of us, when we go in and talk to potential clients, have to continue to think that way and think about what the market's going to look like in the forward, not in the backwards. All right. Well, I want to thank all of our, our three panelists here uh, for sharing their thoughts. And uh, I, I'm not sure who I turn it over to, but I know there's another panel uh, that comes after us. So thank, thanks to everybody. And I'll just give you the applause from here. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Hey, this, this is Rick. Our next panel is the ethics panel. So I'm going to turn it over to Professor Rappaport to get us started on how to be ethical.